All right, so let's tack this lecture video onto the first one from the interdependence um, of organisms PowerPoint. So this section, what shapes an ecosystem, um, and then we'll go through, you know, in several more slides here, if not the rest of it. Um, we'll probably break it off into one more thing. So that being said, um, definition-wise, just habitat is something that we've got to talk about here. Um, simple definition, the area where an organism lives. When we talk about habitats, we're going to talk about both living or biotic factors and non-living or abiotic factors. We've already covered both of those terms, okay, that again, when you put A in front of something, it makes it mean not. So these are our non-living factors. You've got a couple of examples there. Then, of course, anything that falls in any of the kingdoms, RK bacteria, U bacteria, protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia is going to be a biotic factor, right? Notice I'm pulling back to the kingdom chart there, okay? So again, we're going to go back to unit one with everything we do all year long, right? And so then when we look at the combination of abiotic factors and biotic factors, how they interact in the ecosystem, that's going to determine productivity, um, going back to primary productivity specifically, the rate at which photosynthesis um, takes place in an ecosystem to make sugars, um, survival of organisms, growth of organisms. Okay, so we're going to connect a lot of things into that really simple um, explanation right there as far as combinations of various factors determining essentially what's, what's going to happen to organisms in their environment. Okay, so then next, we've got the word in English, we tend to say niche. I'm going to change the camera a little bit here. Okay, um, not that I have a great French ac accent, but in French, this would be niche, right? And so it has kind of a long wordy definition. So it's the range of physical and biological conditions in which an organism lives and the way in which the organism uses those conditions, okay? Um, this is kind of the layman definition. This is not what you need to know, but this is how you need to think about this. So it says the niche is also known as the role that an organism plays in its habitat. All right? And notice here it says that no two species can share the same niche in the same habitat. Okay, so let's talk about kind of some layman examples here. So um, within the school, my niche is I am a teacher, specifically a science teacher. Your niche is that you are a student. Um, one niche that you have specifically as a student is that you are a member of my first period advanced biology class. My anatomy students would be in a different niche. Yes, they are my students, but specifically they are in one of my anatomy classes. Um, if you're in the band and you play the tuba, that is your niche in the band. If you are a point guard on the basketball team, that is your niche on the basketball team. Um, if you run cross country, you're a runner for cross country and you're that's your niche, okay? There's not really a position unless you're maybe always the person who gets first place um, as a Hoover runner, let's just say. Okay, so just kind of take different roles that you might play. Um, you know, your parents, that's their niche in your family, okay? You're the child. Um, so just some kind of layman examples. Um, okay, this part, let's look at this diagram. So notice with this tree, we've got one tree, we've got three different species of warblers, a bay-breasted warbler, a Cape May warbler, and a yellow-rumped warbler. Notice that they each occupy different areas of the tree as far as where they feed. They're going to feed on the same types of organisms, like small insects, for example, but they are going to stay in these areas. Um, and if we were covering this in class, I would essentially ask you, so what would happen if this yellow rumped warbler flew up to the Cape May warbler's territory within the tree, okay, where their niche is? And you're probably thinking, well, they might get in a fight, okay, and that's very true. So um, with these different birds feeding in different locations, it puts them in three different niches, okay, within the same habitat. Um, another good example of this is when we talk about hawks and owls. Um, hawks and eagles, things like that, feed during the day. Owls hunt at night, but they eat the same kinds of things. Rabbits, mice, squirrels, um, maybe a lizard or a snake, depending on the type of animal we're talking about as far as the specific species of hawk or owl. Um, they might pick up a skunk or a raccoon, okay, depending on you know what species we're discussing. But because one group of predatory birds hunts at night and one hunts during the day, they fill different niches in nature. Okay? 
And so as a result of that, organisms fitting into different niches reduces one of the community interactions we're about to talk about, okay? All right, and as we get into this slide, uh, my printer was running out of color ink, so pictures are not as fabulous, but I didn't want to reprint and waste even more ink. So um, when organisms or species fill different niches in nature, that reduces this first community interaction of competition, okay? Um, and as you just, we were talking about with the warblers, that if one warbler flies into another warbler's area within the tree, then hopefully you were thinking, well, they're going to get in a fight, and that's true. Now, competition does not always, always have to be direct fighting, though, okay? Um, it can be competition in different ways. We'll talk about that in a minute. But just by simple definition, competition occurs when organisms of the same or different species attempt to use the same resource in the same place at the same time, right? And that's important that all of those components be in the definition. Um, you've got examples of resources. Most of us know food, water, and shelter. Space is a resource as well. Okay, you've got to have um, space in which to live, all right, or a territory for a certain animal that requires a big area. Um, mates are a resource as well. Um, and a good, just kind of, again, layman example of this is let's say that we were actually having a homecoming dance. Um, and that if there are only 10 girls and there are 15 boys, right, then getting a date to the homecoming dance means that five boys are not going to have a date. Okay, because the females are in short supply. Or it could be the opposite. There's 10 boys and 15 girls. Five girls aren't going to have a date, right? Um, and so mates are a resource, not one you tend to learn until you get to high school, though, okay? But attempting to use the same resource in the same place at the same time. It's the definition of competition. Um, predation, right? This is an interaction where one species catches and feeds on the other. Um, you've got a good example in this picture of a predator, the lynx, okay, hunting or chasing the snowshoe hare. Um, not all predators are going to chase. Some are sit and wait predators, like a snake that might strike as it just sits silently when a mouse walks across its path, okay. Um, and then some will actively hunt like this, okay. By definition, the predator is the organism that catches and feeds on the other organism in the relationship, which is the prey. The organism that's caught and serves as the food source to the predator. Okay, here you've got a picture of some birds fighting over like a little crab. Um, that would be a good example of obviously some direct competition and fighting. Okay, this diagram I know it's really hard to see, but it's um, got little holes in the tree stumps, and you've got some empty holes. Okay, up here you've got four that have birds in them, and a couple that are empty. And then down here, you've got um, that there are all the stumps are full and that there's some birds who don't have a place to live, okay? Um, and so competition for the space or the sheltering area there within those stumps, okay, is increased and you've got four birds who are the lesser competitors, essentially, okay? They don't have a place to live. All right, so the next community interaction, um, so we've got competition, predation, and then symbiosis. So symbiotic relationships, these are relationships where two species live in close association with each other. So that's a very broad definition. And then there are three specific types of symbiosis, right? The first one, mutualism. This is where both species are going to benefit from the relationship. Um, lichens and mycorrhizae, we will talk more about eventually, um, so I won't bother really explaining those too much right now. But lichens are an association between fungus and algae, and mycorrhizae are an association between fungus and the roots of plants, um, where both the fungus and the plant roots, and therefore the whole plant, are going to benefit. Here, both the fungus and the algae are going to benefit. Right? Cleaner fish um, that maybe live in the mouths of larger fish and they pick off parasites um, as a food source. The bigger fish's mouth gets cleaned. Okay, the smaller fish gets a nice meal, right? Cattle egret are kind of the same way. They live on the backs of cattle and they will eat um, insects and things that are bothering cows. Okay, they get a nice meal and then the cow doesn't have quite so many flies bothering. Okay, there's lots of great examples of mutualism in nature. Okay, commensalism, the next one. This is where one species benefits and the other is neither helped nor harmed. 
Um, there are, quite frankly, not that many commensal examples in nature. Um, a bird living in a hole in a tree is sometimes described as being a commensal example. Um, barnacles on a whale. Barnacles are a crustacean. Um, basically think of like a little tin-legged animal, kind of like a crab or a lobster or a crayfish that's in a little shell that looks kind of like the shape of a volcano if you don't know what a barnacle looks like. And they attach to the back of whales and turtles and sometimes to like a pier, like the pilings on a pier. But if they're on the back of a whale or a turtle, then they have a nice place to live. They're getting moved around the ocean and they're going to be able to filter feed really easily um, and take in some zooplankton and phytoplankton as a food source. Right, then the whale is neither helped nor harmed. Okay. And the third one is parasitism. And most people know a little bit about parasitism. So this is where one species lives on or inside another species and harms it. Okay. So you've got two organisms within this as well, the parasite and the host. So the host is the organism that's harmed. Like in this example, your dog or your cat. Okay. The parasite is the organism that benefits. Okay, living in this case of fleas and ticks. There are parasites that are external parasites on maybe your cat or your dog. If we're talking about a parasitic worm, like a tapeworm, for example, that would be an internal parasite inside of the animal's body. Okay, so one species benefits and the other is always harmed in parasitism. All right, and then our last example to talk about on this particular PowerPoint is ecological succession. Um, there's not a lot of information here. We're going to deal with this. Um, another way as well that'll get you some more you know specific details but ecological succession as it says it's a series of predictable changes that are going to occur in a community over time due to either natural or human disturbances um, and notice it gives you the example of regrowth of a forest um, after a fire okay or what happens in an area after a volcanic eruption okay so let's read what this says here real quickly says the structure of the biological community changes over time. If no disturbance occurs, the community will change. The change will be the natural progression and colonization by certain species that are well suited to survive in an area. All right, so look at, let's look at this example. So this term, the pioneer community, you need to know that term. So that's your um, community of organisms that are typically really hardy organisms, like you see like lichens, moss, maybe some photosynthetic bacteria, um, and some things like that, some tiny plants um, that can maybe come in and attach to, essentially to rock, or to survive in soil that um, just is basically just that, just soil. Okay, they get established, and slowly over time, then we have some other producers moving in. Notice you've got some small organisms here, grasses, shrubs, herbs, tree seedlings. Okay, so they take root next, they establish um, a kind of a different level of um, organic matter in the soil, okay? And then you have other organisms that their seeds are able to move into the community, such as in this specific example, aspen, black spruce, and jack pine. Um, but this is still not our mature climax community, okay? Then we've got organisms that still, over here on the far right, the white spruce, the balsam fir, and the paper birch, these are your best competitors in this ecosystem, okay? They are going to outcompete what we see here. These are going to outcompete these. These are going to outcompete these, right? And so that slowly over time, and we might be talking hundreds of years, that if there's no disturbance, we reach this climax community, okay, that you can see the term down here. Um, so your initial community in an area is called a pioneer community, and then slowly over time, the climax community will form. And if there's no disturbance, then that's your mature, in this case, mature growth forest. Let's say there is a fire, and it happens here, okay, between these two middle sections. That means that essentially we go back to square one at that point in time. Let's say there's a fire in a climax community. We're going to go back to square one, okay. Um, and so that being said, anything that we do as humans to disturb areas like in theory, if you mow your lawn um, frequently or routinely, then you are causing a disturbance, talking or knocking back um, ecological succession. If you were to leave your lawn alone and that slowly over time, larger plants moved in than grass and that over time seedlings took place or seedlings germinated um, from trees, that eventually your yard can turn into a forest, all right? 
Um, volcanic eruptions, or so that's kind of a couple of examples. Forest fire, mowing your lawn, um, volcanic eruptions. This is another good example when they take place. All of that molten lava is going to cover up everything in its path um, and that you're starting with essentially barren rock okay and that any of the plants that were in the area are going to be killed by that um, volcanic eruption probably some animals were killed as well some were able to flee potentially to other habitats and surrounding areas um, but you're taking whatever community was there and that was present and knocking it back to barren rock for um, pioneer species to hopefully be able to move into.